Dear friends, good evening. I hope I'm audible. The long distance we are doing, and uh, in these unprecedented times, it is an unusual phenomenon to keep sitting in my room and talking to you people. And uh, during this unprecedented time of war, war with the virus, the coronavirus, we are here sitting here and discussing something that is going to be quite different. First of all, I'd like to thank the industry for keeping us all occupied and continuing our academic run despite us not really being able to do anything solid. Now, I would like to thank the industry first and next go on to each one of you. Remember each one of you to serve your patients. You please protect yourself. Be important. We remember that so much. When I started preparing for the talk, the first thing that my wife told me is, why are you wearing such a colorful dress? This Jill Chang dress, as she calls it. And I told her, the world is gloomy, everybody is sad. So I thought, let them all be cheerful and have some colors for some time. And so we selected on a very colorful dress. So don't worry too much about it. And what I will be doing over the next about 30 to 40 minutes is uh, giving you a dissection of uh, cholesterol lowering beyond statins. So do we really need to do this? Is it really essential to look at cholesterol lowering beyond statins? The one thing you look at this picture, it looks so beautiful. It's got a beautiful pond, it's got a house, it's got everything. Like it's, it's so serene, so beautiful and everything is nice. Statins are more or less like this. They give you everything that you want. So why do you really need to look beyond statins? That's the first question. The reason why we need to look beyond statins is one, that a lot of people have what is called a statin intolerance. Some people don't achieve targets despite a low cholesterol. And what we are doing now, we are getting down the targets lower and lower. And how low is low LDL? We really don't know. And if such a case happens, what are the options? That is what we're going to be seeing over the next 30 to 40 minutes. I think that's where we're going to be standing. Now, when it comes to discussing this lipidemia, the first thing I keep asking is, what do you think is practically the biggest challenge in the treatment of this lipidemia? Whenever I put this poll to the audience, I keep getting a lot of answers. Obviously, I can't get too much over here. But what I hear is one, they say the patients don't like to continue drugs for a long time. Patients get muscle pain, myalgia, some people are worried about diabetes, some people don't like it. And after some time, they become non-compliant because if they take it or not, they don't have any symptoms. But what I have noticed practically, the biggest problem in the treatment of dyslipidemia is something else. The biggest problem in the treatment of dyslipidemia is the laboratory report. You look at the lab reports, what do you notice? You notice that the LDL cholesterol can be 190, 160, 130, low risk, desirable, high, moderate risk, and nothing worse than 100 milligrams. They are quoting the ATP3 guidelines, which is as old as 2002. We have gone 18 years past. And nobody, none of the labs have really changed their reference values. And that is the biggest lacuna that we keep, that we have to remember to change. Now, what about the problems with statins? I said the first one is going to be statin intolerance or adverse effects of statins. Now, the adverse effects of statins has undergone a change, and today they are actually called statin-associated side effects. They're no longer called side effects. They are called not adverse effects. They are called statin-associated side effects. And uh, I have written an article in the Journal of Indian College of Cardiology last issue with the myths and facts of statin side effects, and I'll give you a gist of what I have presented there. The statin-associated muscle effects or the muscle symptoms are seen in about 5 to 20 percent of people. It is more likely, the myalgia is more likely to be statin associated in a few conditions. It is likely if it is going to be bilateral, proximal, and the onset of the muscle pain is within weeks to 12 weeks after the initiation, and it invariably resolves after discontinuation of statins. Remember these four points, bilateral, proximal, onset within 12 weeks of onset of initiation of therapy, and if you stop the therapy, they are going to improve. It's very unlikely if the symptom onset and offset, like the patient tells you, I take the tablet and we immediately get the pain, then it is very unlikely to be statin related. And the symptom onset more than 12 weeks later, unusual. And if there is no improvement when you withdraw the statin, again after 12 weeks, again probably it is not statin related. Similar symptoms, if they happen with other drugs or other lipid lowering therapy, again, this is not the cause of the statin related side effects. So, mind you, you have to be clear about when it is likely to be statin associated with muscle. Statin intolerance is also defined as a person who is unable to achieve LDL target goal because of his inability to take statins because of side effects or elevated enzymes. And uh, this has to be confirmed by discontinuation and rechallenge. And this has to be for at least two statins. Remember, at least two statins, they have to be intolerant to be called perfectly statin intolerant persons. And when do you start looking for this? Whenever you start looking for this, the first thing you look at is look at the additional predisposing factors of the statin-associated problems. 
Now, who is at high risk for statin associated adverse effects? We all know the patient related factors, plenty of patient related factors, simple ones like the age, the female sex, small, frail women, hypothyroidism, alcoholism, excessive physical activity, somebody with known muscle cramps, they are going to be more prone for statin associated side effects. And there are a lot of treatment related side effects. One is high dose statin therapy, some people don't tolerate, lower dose they tolerate, and a lot of drug interactions. Of the drug interactions, the, there are some interesting ones. We all know the Azoles. We also know the macroid antibiotics can create problems, the HIV drugs can create problems. But what is the interesting part of the center panel where the calcium channel antagonists, look at verapamil, diltaism, and amlodipine, they can produce statin associated muscle effects. If you patient with amlodipine and you notice muscle side, try stopping the amlodipine, you might be all right. It may not be that much of a problem. The other common drugs are the amiodarone, ranolazine, the great tools we don't use much here. In epidazone, gemfratrazine, and conifibrate together can also lead to this kind of problems in these two patients. But when it comes to these flash, the statin associated side effects, there's an interesting fact called the nocebo effect. You know the placebo effect. What is the nocebo effect? Now, if, suppose somebody is taking a statin. You tell him you might develop a muscle symptom. He develops it. It's very, very common among doctors. Now, this nocebo effect is being studied very well. And I think the best example was what came in the aspart lipid lowering arm, where in the patients who are blinded, the statin induced muscle side effect was 2.03%. And placebo induced muscle side effect was 2%. Nothing very different. But once the blinding was removed and the patients were taking open label statins, it increased by 1.26% per year and 1% per year for the placebo. It's clearly indicating that when you suggest and they know what drug they're taking, they're more likely to develop these kind of side effects. So this nocebo effect must be kept in mind. And whenever you get into a side effect, what do we try to do? We try to go for silo bullets. What are these silo bullets? Whenever there is a Dracula or a, or a ghost, you try to shoot with the silver bullet, and when you shoot with the silver bullet, that is supposed to die. This is what you see in movies. Now, this is what been tried with statin associated side effects, also with coenzyme Q10, vitamin D, the radish rice, the berberol, the glucosamine. All these have been tried, but none of them hit the target, and none of them have been found to be effective, very clearly, not mentioned at this point in time. Now, we talk about these side effects, the liver function, the creatine kinase. How often do we have to check for all these side effects? Now, one thing is the liver enzymes, the liver enzyme elevation is so rare that it is clearly stated that you check it at onset. If there is no significant elevation, start the patient on drugs and don't check thereafter unless there are going to be side effects. As for the C case, creatine kinase in the same order, don't check routinely. Only if there is a problem, you're going to check it. Otherwise, you're not going to check for any kind of creatine kinase elevation. The next side effect we keep talking about is the diabetes. A lot of people say there is a lot of myth and aura that keeps going on in the social media which keeps stating that uh, statins cause diabetes, so don't take statins. So what happens to these patients? Well, there are several data, a lot of studies which have stated that statins cause diabetes and the biggest uh, claim to fame has been the Jupiter trial which actually showed that when you give 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin, 25% of the, of the persons develop diabetes. And this has been a pretty high figure and if you look at those who develop diabetes and the whole group of patients, the benefits is pretty much the same. The whole group had a 0.56 hazard ratio and for mace events and the hazard ratio was 0.63 for diabetic patients, clearly showing the onset of new onset of diabetes was not creating problem. There's another very interesting point to ponder. In the HOPE 3 trial with rosuvastatin of 10 milligram, the hazard ratio for development of diabetes is 1.02, meaning hardly there. It's not present. So what exactly does the lower panel on the right of your slides in the screen show? This shows that different levels or different strengths of these statins have different kinds of incidence of diabetes of nuance. What happens is if you have a smaller dose of statin, the incidence of diabetes is less. And as the dose increases, the incidence of side effects are more. Now, can you predict whether these people are going to develop nuance of diabetes? Very truly, yes. Because there are some people with specific subsets. Whenever the body mass index is more than 30, fasting blood sugar more than 100, those with metabolic syndrome and HbA1c, which is the pre-diabetic range of more than six, and these groups of persons are the ones who are more prone for statin-induced nuance of diabetes. Now, if you identify these group of patients, put them on a strict lifestyle modification and start treating them, you're going to avoid these side effects, and this can be prevented. The next common side effect or a myth is the statin causing stroke. Now, I'll take you through one study called the Sparkle study. Look at the benefit. The yellow bar is the benefit with the ischemic stroke on the left and uh, the placebo on the uh, the placebo effect and the atrovastatin on the right side. Look at the benefit of the atrovastatin on the right. 8.9% is the effect, 11.7% is placebo. But this is offset by the red numbers, which are the hemorrhagic rate. But the overall benefit is very much there in favor of ischemic stroke. Now, who develops this ischemic stroke? 
Now, this usually develops in persons with small vessel ischemia. Now, these small vessel ischemia persons are the ones who have non obstructive or obstructive coronary artery disease, and they are more prone for subsequent coronary events. Clearly, meaning that the small vessel ischemic disease, which are prone for stroke, are the ones who are going to benefit most from primary prevention or secondary prevention in coronary artery disease. So, you have to remember there is no point in not giving them any kind of statins, whether there is an incident increase in stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and the benefits are much higher. So, please don't hesitate and start them on statins. To summarize the statin adverse effects, now if you treat 10,000 patients over a period of five years, you see what happens. Five develop myopathy, five to 10 develop hemorrhagic stroke, 50 to 100 develop new onset diabetes mellitus, and 500 to 1,000 events are prevented. Look at the benefit. 500 to 1,000 events are averted, and your side effects hardly come to 5 to 50. And what about this diabetes? The diabetes also very well studied in the CTT trial, which has gone ahead and said, that the benefit of statin therapy is 50 times more than the risk of new onset of diabetes and the complications thereof. So I think you should not be worried about it. So if you get an adverse effect to statin, let's say you get a statin intolerance, how do you manage it? Very simple, withdraw the drug, wait for some time, and then what you do, you start a statin rechallenge. How do you rechallenge statins? Start them either with a low dose of statin, either an alternative statin, or alternative statin with another drug like azithromycin. And finally, nothing works, you should try to give a non statin. But the predominant concept is to still give statins because statins are still the best drugs. But what happens in these group of patients? I think this is the motto that we have to remember. This is exactly the way we are fighting Corona 2 today. We are not giving up despite their neck deep in trouble. We are into this one, but still we are trying to kill this one. So, what happens here is whenever you get a statin intolerance, remember very clearly never ever give up. Try to re challenge because the benefits of statins are huge. And if you are not able to tolerate statin, that itself is an independent risk factor for subsequent cardiac events. Remember that very carefully. I will give you a very simple case report of this particular gentleman, 65 year old, OCPCI. Two years later, on those who are starting 20 milligram, he comes up with an HDL of 36, LDL cholesterol of 76. What are you going to do? Are you happy with this level or not happy with this level? What's going to be the target? Because we need to know our target when we start interpreting. I already told you in the beginning. The biggest problem in the treatment of dyslipidemia is not the patient, not the doctor, but the lab reports. Your lab references are forgetting. They are absolutely crazy. So what we are going to be looking at is what are going to be the targets. The latest guideline has been the European Society of Cardiology guideline, which came in September, August, August, September of 2019, which clearly gave few simple values. Somebody who's got any atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease comes in the very high risk category, the lowest red one that you see in the slide. Those persons should have an LDL cholesterol target of 55 milligrams, less than 55. Those with high risk, meaning diabetes with multiple risk factors, or those with chronic kidney disease, a target of 70 milligrams. Those with more low risk or moderate risk persons, those are diabetics who are less than 50 years of age, those persons' target LDL is going to be 100. The low risk people, meaning no other risk factors, absolutely normal sitting people in the 30s and 40s, even there the LDL cannot be more than 115 milligrams. So remember these values, 55, 70, 100, and 115. They're going to give you the target values for your cholesterol. But it doesn't stop there. If you get a disease at an LDL of less than 55, you have a second cardiac event. The subsequent recommendation is you can bring it down to less than 40. So if you have either a polyvascular disease or a second vascular event within two years, you can bring it down further to 40 milligrams. Now, is this always the two? Is it always the accepted levels? What about the Indian values? In India, the Lipid Association of India came up with its own guidelines and it came up as early as 2016. I was lucky to be a part or member of this uh, particular council and we came up with the four risk categories, the low risk in the green, the moderate risk, high risk and the very high risk. The very high risk group is the one with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and diabetes with multiple risk factors. So what are the risk factors? We get very simple risk factors, age more than 45 or 55, family history with a a first degree relative more than 55 or less than 65, 55 or 65, smoking, hypertension, or a low HDL cholesterol. So very simple factors. If you have three of these risk factors, you come to the high risk category. Chronic kidney disease comes into risk category. Moderate risk, if you have two or more risk factors, you get into the moderate risk. Now, what are going to be the targets for these people? Very high risk, as early as 2016, the liquidization of India was the first guideline to give you a value of 50 milligrams, which all the guidelines are coming to now. High risk persons 70, moderate risk 100, and even low risk like Indians are more prone for coronary artery disease, there you try to target about 100 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. LDL is the primary target of health. 
Now, the liberalization of India is also coming up with the revision. The new statement is coming, expected in 2020. It is in press. I think thanks to all the all the hangama that is going on, the halabalula going on right now, it's not going to come up. We have a new category. You see on the extreme right, shown as the extreme high risk group that is coming on, and these patients are going to be targeted much further. And this extreme high risk group of patients who are not getting into problems and who are getting into problems despite a goal LDL of 50 milligrams, there they are giving an optional new target of 30 milligrams. How do you do it? You start them on the maximum tolerated dose of statins. They don't tolerate it. Next, add an ezetimibe. They don't try to add a PCSK9 inhibitor and try to get down the target. So the new target, optional target, is going to be 30 milligrams for persons who are having a polyvascular disease or who are getting a second event despite having an LDL cholesterol of 50. The rest of the targets are pretty much the same. So mind you, the cholesterol values are getting lower and lower. And the European Society of Cardiology also has given the same recommendation. Start with the statin. It doesn't work. Add ezetimibe. It doesn't work possibly in the high-risk categories. Start using these patients on PCSK9 inhibitors. But what is the effect of combination of these drugs? The high-intensity statins, like what we know is the 20 or 40 milligrams of prosuvastatin, atorvastatin of 40 or 80 milligrams, they bring down the LDL cholesterol by 50%. If you start adding an ezetimibe, it brings it down by 65%. And if you combine all the three, look at the last of this, 85% of the cholesterol can be brought down. It doesn't work always, but most of the time it is pretty effective. But does it how is it how it works in clinical practice? Is this the way it really works? And if you look at it practically, there are a lot of limitations of statins. If you look at the statin therapy as a whole, 10% of patients are non-responders to statins. How many of you have noticed this? 40% are hyporesponders. They have a suboptimal response. They don't have this 50% response. This I'm sure all of you have seen. People don't achieve targets. Now, what exactly is the incidence in India? Now, I did a study in my own clinic called the Ashwin Clinic. And uh, I should be privileged to say that uh, my colleague who had done the study with me, Vasanthan, is at Luton right now fighting corona. And I should thank him for all the data that we have given up here. And uh, we studied about 1,000 patients with uh, coronary artery disease and looked at the cholesterol. We found out that most of the patients were getting, look at this, 46% here, the green one here, that those patients are getting 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin, and a third of these patients were getting 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin. Most of the other patients were getting lower dose of atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. And how were they achieving the target? Only 56% of the patients achieved a modest target of 70 milligrams. Mind you, this is a, a, a one year old, so even then, only 56% were achieving. And which are the groups of patients which are achieving this target? You notice, that the first four are the atorvastatin groups and the last four are the rosuvastatin groups in the increasing order. The highest benefit was found in the 80 milligrams of atorvastatin because I start most of them when they have an ACS on an atorvastatin 80. If they have achieved target, they're going to be on that. And if they don't achieve target, I put them on 20 rosuvastatin and 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin subsequently. 20% of these patients were getting rosuvastatin plus ezetimibe also. Despite that, the total achievement of target was only 56%. This clearly shows two things. One, there is a heterogeneity in statin response. Not everybody is going to respond to the statins the same way. And second thing, even if you use a very high level of statin and ezetimibe, you still are not able to achieve a good target. So once you're not able to achieve target, what do you do? You start looking at alternatives. What are the alternatives we have today? Ezetimibe, the bile acid secretions, fibrates, niacin, omega-3 fatties, PCSK9, and benzodiazepine. acid. I'm not going to talk about everything. We'll talk about a few of the important things that are available in India today. The first one we'll be talking about is ezetimibe. You've all been hearing about ezetimibe quite a lot. And ezetimibe is a very simple molecule. When you take it orally, it undergoes glucuronidation in the intestinal wall and undergoes an enterohepatic circulation. That's the reason why it's got a long half life. You can give it once a day because it undergoes enterohepatic circulation. What it does is selectively inhibits the cholesterol transport co protein in even pick C-like 1 protein, which reduces the absorption of cholesterol. So it reduces the absorption of dietary cholesterol. It also selectively inhibits biliary absorption of cholesterol also. It also has an inhibited effect on plant steroids, but it does not have any absorption effect on triglycerides, fat-soluble vitamins, or drugs. So it is a very effective drug which does not interfere with our drugs and the fat-soluble vitamins. Now, how much does the acetamide bring down the LDL cholesterol? We see the attack. What is that practically? Practically, several studies have been done and shown that it brings down the LDL cholesterol by 18.5%. Now, this is what is the action. But when it comes to effects, we want to know more effects. So the big study that was done first time was the enhanced study, 
which you wanted to find out if it has all the additional benefits of statins. Like statin has all those pleiotropic benefits like reducing plus blood volume, methroma volume, what about this drug in that drug. So they studied in the enhanced trial over 24 months and found from a 39 milligram, 40 milligram reduction of uh, simvastatin monotherapy, simvastatin and ezetimibe had a 55% reduction of the LDL cholesterol. So it's a remarkable reduction of LDL cholesterol when you combine ezetimibe. But what about the intimomedial thickness reduction? No significant change. That's the sad part. So what happened was the editorials and all the major things came up and said, if you look what's being inside the red bar, the editorial said the results show what they show and the results are very disappointing. So only statins and no other thing other than statin, no non-statins have any beneficial effects. This was the statement at that point when this study came. But subsequently, this was changed over by the improved trial which studied ezetimibe in combination with simvastatin again. What they did was they took patients with uh, with uh, standard medical therapy and interventional therapy, they combined simvastatin 40 mg and, and um, studied it with 40 mg of simvastatin along with ezetimibe. And what were the results showing? The reduction in LDL cholesterol as expected was fantastic. The median levels were 69 or 70 with the simvastatin. And when you use a combination, it came down as low as 53. Now, this is one of the most important reasons why the 55 and 50 targets are being arrived at because this is being shown to be beneficial. Look at the results in this. The simvastatin had a 34.7 percentage events while it came down to 32 percent, and the number needed to treat for additional benefit over simvastatin was as low as 50. Remarkable benefits were shown with the ezetimibe. And if you look at individual endpoints, surprisingly, it doesn't show change in mortality, but it shows reduction in cardiovascular events, MI, stroke, ischemic stroke, and uh, this was the major group. The stroke reduction is where this drug really scored over. When it comes to side effects, no significant side effects. Nothing was statistically significant that was signed with ezetimibe and it was good. So what has it proven? It has proven three important points. The first point was that non-statin liquid lowering, meaning ezetimibe, can reduce cardiovascular events. The second, lower than 70, even up to 50, seems to be better. 53 is better than 70. First time it has been shown. And it is very safe to use ezetimibe in combination with the statin. But this has reaffirmed the LDL hypothesis stating that lower levels of LDL are very, very effective. So the clinical utility of ezetimibe has been as an add-on to statins, as a monotherapy, and in, there are certain groups of patients called high cholesterol absorbers, there also it's useful. The second drug is vampiroic acid. Vampiroic acid is pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same as uh, the uh, statins that we use. If you look at the mechanism of action of vampiroic acid, this is the cholesterol synthesis within the liver cell. You look down, the first N2 that you see is the ATP citrate lyase, which is blocked by the vampiroic acid. The second cross, black cross that you notice in the middle is the HMG coa reductase. Now, both these block the cholesterol synthesis within the liver because of which there are plenty of LDL receptors on the liver cell to take in cholesterol from the outside, bring it inside the liver and destroy them. This is how both the statins and the vampiroic acid work. Now, this drug is given as an oral agent, 120 to 240 milligrams, and 180 milligrams have been studied. And how efficacious is that? The Clear Wisdom trial is the largest trial which studied the efficacy, long-term efficacy, and how much does it work. The first thing it was, it was found, studied on patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and uh, heterozygous venial hypercholesterolemia. Baseline characteristics pretty much the same, and how effective was that compared to placebo? This is on top of statins. Now, when you compare it to placebo, there is a 15% reduction in the LDL cholesterol. Now, this is pretty good. 15% reduction of LDL cholesterol in these group of patients. But what about the other parameters? LDL 15%, total cholesterol 9%, upper lipoprotein B is brought down by 9%, and 10% reduction of non HDL cholesterol also. So, all parameters of cholesterol are brought down by vendidoic acid. It's coming up, it's approved by the US, and it's soon coming up in our own place. And what about the HSCRP? We have already been interested in HSCRP after the Jupiter trial showed that reduction of HSCRP is uh, beneficial. This also showed an 18% reduction in HSCRP, much more than conventional drugs. And what about patients who are already on statins? Now, this is interesting. Look at the first one. First one shows 15% in all patients. No statin therapy. There was a 24% reduction in LDL cholesterol compared to a nearly 15% reduction in patients who are getting a low or moderate intensity or high intensity statin. Now, this drug is now going to be very useful in patients who don't tolerate statins because you have a 24% percent 
which is a very good amount of reduction of the cholesterol. What about the safety and tolerability? This study looked at a lot of factors, but basically look at the placebo and the and the benzoic acid, not very different. And it has been found to be a very safe, well tolerated drug with 15% lowering of LDL cholesterol. Adverse effect profiles profile not very different. And there was a trend towards reduction of major cardiovascular events. It's a very short study, but there was a 2% slightly lower cardiac events with benzoic acid. The trend is going in the right direction. Probably if you have a long-term trial, you're going to have better effects. What about the glycemic measurement? Does it produce nuanced diabetes? No, did not show any change. Now, this benzoic acid has also been studied along with ezetimibe. And look at this. The first blue mark one is the benzoic acid and ezetimibe. And look at the third panel of 40 milligrams of azoostatin. More or less similar effects in reduction of LDL cholesterol. Only thing, the HSCRP reduction with azoostatin seems to be more. So the amount of LDL cholesterol lowering with a combination of uh, Lepidoic acid and ezetimibe seems to be formidable. And at this point of time, we have a single dose oral drug which is going to be working individually at about 15 to 20 percent protection of LDL, and probably in combination with ezetimibe, 35 to 40 percent protection is going to be possible. So far, no cardiovascular outcome trials are there. Probably we'll have to wait. This is probably the drug that's going to come up in future if statins are intolerant. The next drug that we're going to be talking about is omega 3 fatty acids. Now, we keep talking about omega 3 fatty acids. I'm sure everybody is used to it. But I'm also very sure that nobody has used it in the correct way, the correct combination for the correct patient. I'm very sure about it. Why do I say? Because the omega-3 fatty acids, there are two kinds, the omega-6 and the omega-3. Both are different because the, the starting point is the linoleic acid and the alpha-linoleic acid. The linoleic acid can be brought down very easily to the arachidonic acid within the body. But this change of the omega-3 fatty acids from alpha-linoleic acid from the green leafy vegetables going down to the EPA and the DHA, the eicosapentaenoic acid and the decosapentaenoic acid. This does not happen very easily inside the body. So we have to supplement these omega-3 fatty acids separately from outside and the biggest, best source is the oily fish. So if you give the other points that are given on top, they really don't get converted as well into EPA. Now the biggest study has been the reduced trial which was published in November 2018. In November 2018, they studied patients with coronary artery disease or 50 years di plus diabetic patients with multiple risk factors. They studied nearly 8,000 patients and uh, these patients were randomized to 4 grams of purified icosapentethyl, that meaning 2 grams twice a day of EPA and a placebo study. And they found that the primary mace reduction was 25% over and above statins. That's important. Over and above statins, 25% reduction and a 20% reduction in mortality which is phenomenal. But why is this drug not being caught on? Why are we not using this drug? Two reasons. The subsequent cardiac event rate reduction also has been shown to be useful. And this has been, this has been shown to be effective across several subsets. Now, if you look at patients with different levels of triglycerides, 150, more than 150, look at the one, two, three, four, the last but one panel, even with an LDL cholesterol less than 67, this drug seems to be effective. So even at low levels of LDL, EPA seems to be effective. So there is something phenomenal. It is not just the omega-3 fatty acid, but there is something beyond it. Now I asked you why this drug is not popular. For a simple fact, EPA is available in the purified form. It's just one, one capsule called Vasipa, which is available in the United States. It costs about two, two dollars. It's two and a quarter dollars. So if you take two grams twice a day, it's going to cost you ten dollars a day, which is equivalent to 700 rupees a day. And you have to continue this drug lifelong. And that is going to be difficult. It's going to be a very expensive drug. Unless there's going to be some method of reducing the price, it's not going to be used in future. Now, what we commonly do is we start using omega-3 fatty acids, all the preparations that are available in the doctor. So what they have found out is that these drugs are not really useful. This is the Ascent Omega-3 trial, which showed between the placebo and the LO and the omega-3, there's no significant difference in the benefits. And this has also been subsequently found in several other studies showing there's been no benefits. In fact, the mineral oil that is present in the omega-3 fatty acids can be harmful and please stop using the other preparations of EPA, DHA because none of them are useful. And if you want to waste the money, don't waste the money on that. Use it on statins or some other drugs which are going to be more useful for these group of patients. So this is why we stand. Now what about the treatment of hypertriglyceridemia? Most commonly used indication for omega-3 fatty acid is hypertriglyceridemia. Now there are several drugs that we use to treat hypertriglyceridemia. Statin sensors, fibrates, is it my sarobitazar, PCSK9 and it does. I'm sure each of you have your own concepts. I'm sure each of you have your own ideas of starting to use these drugs. I think you will have to be looking at which drug to use when. 
I think the American guideline gives you the best answer. If you have a hypertriglyceridemia, the first thing you do is start looking at secondary causes of hypertriglyceridemia. Uncontrolled diabetes, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, and hypothyroidism. Several drugs like steroids are going to produce these side effects and start looking at beta blockers, thiazides, and all those drugs that can increase triglyceride. And the best way to treat hypertriglyceridemia is very simple. Look at lifestyle factors, secondary, secondary factors, and start medication as a last resort. Lifestyle modification, reduce carbohydrates, increase exercise, you can bring down triglycerides. The best way to reduce triglycerides, you know what it is? You starve them, triglycerides come down. That's the best way to reduce the triglycerides. If you are between 20 years and 75 years, look at triglycerides. Unless it goes more than 500, do a lifestyle modification and it may be reasonable to probably start statins. If it goes more than 500, still statins are reasonable. And if you still have a persistently elevated triglyceride, especially if it's more than 1,000, and if you think there is going to be a problem suspecting pancreatitis, then you start looking at, in addition to lifestyle changes, avoiding carbs and alcohol, omega-3 fatty acids as the first choice, and if it still doesn't work, probably phenofibrates as the last resort. What we commonly do is use phenofibrates. Please don't use them. Come to that as a last resort, and at that point, you should start using this drug as a last resort only to prevent pancreatitis. Otherwise, don't use these drugs in clinical practice. There's another case report I want to give you. It's a slightly different case. Look at what happens here. 56 year old diabetic post PCI started on a high intensity statin. He comes after three months with an LDL of 45. I think that's good, right? What about HDL of 25? How many of you are going to be happy with that? HDL cholesterol of 25 milligrams. 25 milligrams of HDL. Are you happy? Not happy with that. If you look at the HDL cholesterol of 25, what you notice is it is it low or not so low. HDL cholesterol has got a very, very interesting, interesting story. One of the most consistent relationships with uh, epidemiology and atherosclerotic disease has been whenever the HDL has been low, there has been an increase in atherogenicity. Primarily because it promotes reverse cholesterol transport or the cholesterol efflux, which brings out the cholesterol from the periphery back to the liver. But HDL cholesterol also has got anti inflammatory, anti thrombotic, and antioxidant properties, and it also improves endothelial function. But does it always work like this? We have always noticed whenever the triglycerides are high, the HDL comes lower. The reason is, whenever the triglycerides are high, the HDL, instead of containing more of cholesterol, it actually contains more of triglycerides. It's enriched with triglycerides. And these triglycerides enrich HDL are more rapidly catabolized. They contain less of cholesterol and their capacity for efflux seems to be coming down. And how do we increase HDL? The commonest mode is the therapeutic lifestyle modification, physical activity, smoking sensation, weight loss, alcohol consumption, and Mediterranean diet. All these improve the HDL cholesterol by 5 to 20 percent. What about pharmacological increase? Statins, marginal increase in HDL. Fibrates to some extent, but they don't have other beneficial effects. The nicotinic acid with niacin has been studied in AIM High and HPS2 trials. Both have been failure trials. We are not going to discuss about niacin any further. The CETP inhibition has been found to be effective. But what about the CETP inhibition, the dalcitrapid, the evacitrapid, the anacitrapid trials? The DALCITRAPID trial, the DAL outcomes trial, had about 15,000 patients studying 600 milligrams of DALCITRAPID with placebo. And what happens to this study? You look at the increase from the blue line to the red line, a remarkable increase in the HDL cholesterol happened. With no change in the LDL cholesterol looking at the lower panel. So with a fantastic improvement in HDL cholesterol, you will improve a fantastic improvement of the results. But look at the results of NACE reduction, absolutely no change. So there is an improvement in HDL cholesterol, but no clinical benefits. Where does it take us? Similarly, the Accelerate trial with the Evacitrapid, similar results, fantastic improvement in the HDL cholesterol. But what about clinical results? No significant reduction in even rate. Now, what does this show? The increase in HDL is not beneficial. In fact, the European Society of Cardiology 2019 has warned you that if your HDL cholesterol is more than 90 milligrams percent, what happens is that it can be harmful. What happens here is that the HDL cholesterol, instead of when it is low, there is an increased atherogenicity. Now, what happens is as it seems to be growing higher, there is an increased atherogenicity that seems to be happening. Now, this is the paradox that has happened with HDL cholesterol. Now, what happens here is the HDL cholesterol starts becoming what is called as dysfunctional HDL cholesterol. This happens in a specific few conditions like diabetes, coronary artery disease, renal insufficiency. And patients, in this group of patients, the 
the HDL becomes dysfunctional and does not do its work. In an acute phase HDL, like in an acute myocardial infarction, even if the HDL is high, it doesn't seem to be doing the job. And the vascular effects can be negative and harmful. Now, this is mediated by the proteomes that are present inside the HDL, the myeloperoxidase, the LCAT, the one one the SA, and the oxy-LDL and the oxy-HDL have also been proven to be in the cause of this particular pattern. What we do clinically when we measure HDL is, we measure the cholesterol content of HDL, which really doesn't mean anything, because we don't know whether the HDL is doing its job of cholesterol efflux. So what we should be doing is measuring the cholesterol efflux capacity, which cannot be done in routine practice, it is only done in research. So you'll have to be looking at the myeloperoxidase activity or the SAA level of activity in the HDL, which are not done routinely. That is the reason why the HDL cholesterol really doesn't seem to correlate with the amount of atherosclerotic disease. So low HDL cholesterol has been a story that has become complicated and it is related to the triglycerides in inverse relationship and it seems to be reversely, reversely working with that. And the prognosis of the disease, that the atherosclerotic disease cannot be determined by the HDL levels. So checking up an HDL is not going to be very beneficial. It's a totally new concept that is coming up. But if your HDL is low, use physiological measures, lifestyle modification, and this can improve and give some protective effect, but there is no beneficial effect with drug-based treatment as of date. We might see something later. The last drug that I want to talk about is the PCSK9 inhibitor. If you want to understand the PCSK9 inhibitor, you must understand a little bit about how the PCSK9 and the liver reacts when there is a LDL particle and an LDL cholesterol. Look at the left side picture, you will notice there is a small green bot here that is the LDL, or the LDL comes to the receptor it gets inside the liver cell by endocytosis and there the cholesterol is removed and the LDL receptor comes back to the surface for removing of further LDL. Look on the right side, when there is a PCSK9 present, what happens? The endocytosis happens but the LDL receptor does not come out because it is destroyed by lysosomes and there is no further availability of the LDL receptor. So this is the problem. So when there are plenty of PCSK9s, what happens? There is a gain of function. So what happens is that this is the basis. There is a gain of function in genetic mutations where there is plenty of PCSK9 where the LDL levels are very high. So what scientists thought, if there is going to be a gain of function, what happens if you remove the PCSK9? There might be a loss of function. This is the concept on which this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be beneficial. What happens is the loss of function has been studied and this is the basis for development of monoclonal antibodies against PCSK9. And when the PCSK9 removes all the PCSK, PCSK genes, what happens is the LDL receptors are regenerated to remove more and more of LDL from the circulation and that is how this works. The ACC in 2018 came a clear guideline and started saying that those persons with history of multiple vascular events should be given, if they don't achieve an LDL target of 70, those people must be started on a PCSK9. So you start them on statins, next we basically might if it doesn't work, start them on PCSK9 inhibitors. Now who are these very high risk persons? Any people with a recent ACS, history of myocardial infarction, stroke, or get vascular disease. There are two of these. Basically, meaning polyvascular disease. Either one coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, and third is a cerebrovascular disease. Or you have one of these with multiple two risk factors. What are these risk factors? The common garden risk factors diabetes, hypertension, smoking, CKD, the family history of coronary artery disease, or an age more than 55, and LDL that is not getting controlled. Now, these two of them, most of our patients already have. So all these patients, if you don't achieve target, probably should be started on a PCSK9 inhibitor. And when you start using PCSK9 inhibitors, 70 plus with atherosclerotic disease, you start them. But look at the last panel. Look at this. Here you notice the terminal hypercholesterolemia. Don't wait to 70. If the LDL is more than 100, you will be noticing that you must be starting them on a PCSK9 inhibitor. Now, if you don't reach a target of 55, start PCSK9. This is the European guideline 2019. So you don't have to wait to 70, even if you don't get 55, even if you get 70, 55 minus also, if you don't achieve, you have to start them on a PCSK9. This is a European recommendation, it's as late as 2019. Now, what does the Indian guideline say? The latest guideline says 50, if you don't achieve, or if you have polyvascular disease and you're still at very high risk, you may consider starting them, being very stringent on the threshold for starting PCSK9. And what we are doing now is getting the bar lower and lower, and lower the LDL cholesterol seems to be the better. We are bringing it down considerably. There are several trials on PCSK9, and uh, the GLAGO trial showed there is a reduction in atheroma volume that has been fantastic. And what the reason why I put up this slide is 
even with the LDL cholesterol of up to 20 milligram, there was regression of atherosclerosis. So lower the LDL cholesterol, more was the regression. And there have been two major trials with two PCSK9 inhibitors, the Evolocumab and the Alirocumab. And uh, both the trials have shown significant, nearly 50 to 60 percent reduction in the LDL cholesterol. Look at the clinical benefits, 15 percent mass reduction despite the patient being on statins. Well, this is very, very important. Similar results with the ODC trial, but in the ODC trial, you notice that towards the end of the trial, the value was drifting upward. The reason was if the LDL came less than 30 milligrams, they withdrew the drug. They didn't want too low a value of LDL in this trial. That is the reason the LDL started going up. Don't think it's not working. It was not, that was not the reason. Here also similar 15% reduction. What about the LDL levels and the uh, PCSK9 inhibitors? Now, if you look at the panel on the left, middle, and the right, whenever the LDL levels were higher, the benefits were higher. The right look at the two lines, they seem to be diverging much earlier. Now, if you have the LDL cholesterol lower, the lower up to 20 milligram, you see that the benefits are much, much better. And if you have time from the qualifying myocardial infarction, now we are looking at subsets of patients who derive maximum benefits. Now, if your duration of starting the PCSK known is less than two years following myocardial infarction, or somebody who gets an MI more than two years following myocardial infarction, the one who has had a recent MI less than two years, the benefit seems to be much higher. Looking at the benefit here, the relative risk reduction is 24% compared to 13% if it is more than two years. If you had multiple prior MIs, again, the benefit seems to be higher. Look at the left, more than two prior MIs, the benefit seems to be much more compared to the one on the right. Now, if you have a single vessel disease or a multi-vessel coronary artery disease, again, more the disease, more the benefit. So finally, if you look at this particular slide, if you look at those patients who have polyvascular disease, the blue, the red, and the green, single vascular bed disease is the blue. You look at the benefit in the second panel, the two vascular beds, look at the last one, the multivascular disease or polyvascular disease, the ODC trial, more the vascular systems involved, more seems to be the benefit. So if you look at diabetic patients, again, if you're going to be diabetic indicating high risk, the benefit of PCSK9 is more. What is going to be the other subgroup? The chronic kidney disease patients. Here also you notice the blue is the placebo, the benefit is more of the red on the PCSK9 inhibitors. So primarily, if you look at multiple of these uh, high-risk features, what are the high-risk features? Less than two years post-MI, multiple MIs, more than two MIs, or you have multi-vessel disease. If you have more of these, the more of these features, look at the blue line, more than one feature, the benefit seems to be more, and the absolute risk reduction seems to be nearly 2.5% in these two patients. This, this, this drug also works in peripheral arterial disease, significant reduction in the major adverse limb events also, there is an interesting correlation between LP little a and this drug also, because more the LP little a, more seems to be the benefit of PCSK9 inhibitors. But this is a correlation between PCSK9 and the LP little a levels. I give you one better one. The next slide it shows less than the median and more than the median. Median is the middle value of the LDL uh, lipoprotein little a. If the value is more of the LPA, which is going to be beneficial. Now, if you remember Salim Yusuf's and his uh, statements, LP little a is probably the dangerous cholesterol or the hidden risk factor among Indians, because we seem to be having more of LP little a, and this more of LP little a seems to be the group where PCSK9 seems to be working very, very well. Now, those with a very high risk factor like this, if you look at it, the number needed to treat is just 21%. 21% if you, persons, if you treat, you're going to have a reduction in cardiovascular event, which I think is phenomenal in a very high risk subgroup of patients. So finally, to summarize the PCSK9, anybody else, this works whenever you don't reach the target, more so if you've had a recent myocardial infarction, less than two years, multiple myocardial infarctions, multivessel disease, multiple high-risk features, baseline high lipoprotein little a, peripheral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and possibly the diabetic subgroup of patients. You can bring down the LDL cholesterol with a statin by about 70%. Alone also, it seems to be working in about 50% of these patients. So this is a new drug. PCSK9 is also available in India, which can be used in statin intolerant patients, familiar lipocholesterolemia, and whenever you don't reach target in a person with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, I will give you another case sheet that came to my clinic. Now, this gentleman came, he's a 65 year old post PCI, two years later, and uh, what he had was this lipid profile. Just focus on the LDL cholesterol he has achieved with 40 milligrams of prosuvastatin. He has got an LDL cholesterol of 20.9. What will you do? 21 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. Would you like to reduce the statin or continue the same? What would you like to do? 
how many of you would like to reduce the statin or continue the stain? Essentially, how safe is low LDL cholesterol? With a proven study trial between 80 mg and less than 40 mg, look at the four colors, not very different amounts of myalgia between 80 to 100 and less than 40 mg. Not much of difference between the liver enzyme elevation or the CPK elevation or the hemorrhagic stroke. Similarly, in the improved trial, look at values of less than 0 0.8. Less than 0 0.8 is going to be about 30 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. From 30 to 1.8, which is nearly about 70 milligrams of LDL cholesterol, look at the four colors, the myalgia, the adverse effects totally, liver enzyme elevation, neurocognitive dysfunction, nothing changed, meaning that this drug is pretty safe. Even in the four-year trial, some of these patients had a baseline value, which was very low, and uh, some of these patients achieved an LDL cholesterol of 21 milligrams. And despite achieving this, you notice that there are no significant adverse effects in these groups. The only major adverse effects seem to be local injection site reactions. And in this group of patients, look at the side effects. Look at the side effects between less than 20 milligrams and more than 100 milligrams of LDL cholesterol. Look at all the panels, systemic adverse effects, new onset diabetes, cancers, cataracts, neurocognitive dysfunctions, liver enzyme elevation, CK elevation, non-cardiovascular test, hemorrhagic stroke, everything was no different, meaning that very low levels of LDL cholesterol are pretty much safe. In fact, 500 patients achieve an LDL in the single digit of less than 10 milligrams. And look at those who achieved it, the pink ones, the cardiovascular efficacy is better, safety is pretty much the same in these group of patients. This has been shown, the safety in low levels have been shown even in the Oslo trial. And finally, it is definitely concluded that a 20 to 25 milligrams of LDL cholesterol seems to be pretty safe in clinical practice. And we have seen that it is very safe. But you still want to reduce it? Are you sure you want to reduce it and keep it at this level? How many of you would like to reduce the dose? I'm talking about 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin. How many of you would like to reduce it to 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin? Would you reduce the dose? Is there an answer to that question? I was looking for this question, answer to this question. They found out one very interesting trial in post-PCI patients who are achieving LDL target, but whether they were on a high-intensity statin or a non-high-intensity statin. They were all on statins. Now, they studied about 8,000 patients, 1,700 achieved targets, of which 372 were on high-intensity statin and 1,300 on non-high-intensity statin. Now, you look at the red bar, which is non-high-intensity statin and the high-intensity statin, those who are taking high intensity statin despite achieving same levels of LDL, the incidence of adverse effects was significantly lower. And this is a remarkable study. And this seems to be working across different subgroups of patients. And uh, this has been a very, very remarkable study which shows that post PCI, all your patients must not only look for low LDL levels of 70 milligrams according to the American guidelines, but also put them on a high intensity statin, no moderate or low intensity statin. Start a high intensity statin, continue high intensity statin, and don't stop. If you reduce the dose and go to a moderate, you're risking them for a subsequent cardiac event. Now, this one, if you start looking at literature, there are going to be a lot of murky drugs that are coming. A lot of drugs that I've spoken of, I talk about this basically because when I looked at and searched, we found out some new drugs like the mypomersan, which is actually an anti sense oligonucleotide, which is actually an RNA, mRNA blocking drug which actually reduces the amount of apolipoprotein B that is produced. Apolipoprotein B is present on all the atherogenic lipoprotein molecules. Lomitopide is another thing that reduces the BLDL production and the LDL apheresis. All these are available. Now, before I give you to my conclusion, I would like to take you to one elderly gentleman who I was privileged to listen to during the European Society of Cardiology. The old man is nothing other than, nobody other than G. Braunwald. Braunwald in his article and his speech, he said, what is the right age to start with lowering therapy? He said there are three basic principles. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death and disability among adults. An elevated LDL cholesterol is the most important risk factor for the development and progression of ASCVD. What is the level of LDL to lower? Lower the better. Very clearly, lower the better seems to be the mantra for LDL. Now the next slide is even more interesting. He gives two important concepts of atherosclerosis, which I found really fascinating. It not only depends on the level of LDL cholesterol. Look at the first panel, which says, cumulative LDL burden, circulating LDL cholesterol, and the number of years of exposure. This is going to determine how long you've had LDL cholesterol high. So start treating the persons early. Start treating it early, because we are very soon going to come up with a concept 
of ASC meaning threshold, which is going to be at how many levels of this cumulative LDL burden is a person going to develop an atherosclerotic cardiovascular? Very exciting concept, which I thought was the ASC meaning threshold is probably what you should be looking at. Probably start hitting LDL cholesterol much earlier and start treating them much, much earlier and try to reduce their burden of LDL cholesterol. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, my last conclusion is the first one is low LDL is safe. Statins are the best drugs. Start using the maximum tolerated dose of statin and preferably a high intensity statin. Don't reduce to moderate intensity statin. Ezetimide is probably the first add on therapy alone. If you don't tolerate it, maybe with benzoic acid if it comes up. Omega 3 fatty acids only EPA, not a combination. And you're going to use a combination of these drugs with statins also, and the dose is 2 grams twice a day, not the conventional drugs. PCSK9, specifically if you don't reach targets, more benefits in if you're less than 2 years MI, multivessel disease, more than 2 MI, chronic kidney disease, polyvascular disease, the benefit seems to be higher. Two points I want to add up, HDL cholesterol no longer has the importance that it used to have in the past. Two, triglycerides, still statins are number one. Number two is the omega-3 fatty acids, and if you still don't achieve it, the only role for fibrates is going to be to avoid pancreatitis when the values of triglycerides are very, very high. I hope I have been able to give you some insight into a lot of lipidology. I try to cram up a lot of things. I hope all of you have had a good time and thank you very much for the listening. Now I'll take the questions. We'll there are a lot of questions here. I'll try to pick up as many questions as I can. You can type your questions and I keep getting them as and when they come. Can you explain about upper level proteins and significance in monitoring it? It's a great question. I'm sure Vasantan is listening to this. Upper lipoprotein B is present in each of the atherogenic particles, meaning it is going to be present in LDL, ILDL, VLDL, lipoprotein little a is present in the chylomicrons also. So each of these contains one particle of upper lipoprotein B. The LDL cholesterol is brought down by the statins, upper B is not. So if the number of upper lipoprotein B particles are brought down significantly, it is going to bring down the number of atherogenic particles. And those particles which are less than 70 microns are the ones that get into the cells and produce a problem. So the checking the upper lipoprotein B specifically has been recommended in the current European guideline. And it says those diabetic patients, patients with very low LDL cholesterol, obese and metabolic syndromes, this might be a better parameter to measure. So I think that's one. Vasantar has got a question. Vasantar is scared. Oh. When starting PCSK9, is it always an add-on to statin ezetimide? PCSK9 monotherapy? And then add on statin estimate if necessary. That is question one. Now, PCSK9 by recommendation is going to be statin, add estimate if you don't tolerate PCSK9. Possibly in the very high familial homozygous hypercholesterolemia where you don't tolerate statins, it might work. But not all persons with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, it works. Because some of these patients have do not have LDL receptors. If it does not, there's no LDL receptors, the drug is not going to work. So the first time you do PCSK, you check the values and make sure this drug works. That is one that you have to be there. There are a lot of other questions. Sarum little sarum hyperplatelet redemia. Okay, now it's a very tricky question. There are no outcome trials with any of the fibrates or sarum little sar. My take on sarum little sar is if you really want to use a drug to reduce the triglycerides alone, sarum little sar is as good as the fibrates. Both don't have any fantastic outcome trials, but the usage of both these drugs has to be very very minimal. Go for the statins, go for the lifestyle modification. That is going to be a better choice than starting to use these drugs. So don't use it too much. Shilpi has asked any change in therapy in corona positive patients. We don't have data on that, so I don't I can't give you an answer. There's a trial called Corona Trial with Heart Failure, which if you want to continue with that, I'm not going to do that that much at this point in time. There's another question which says for high triglycerides more than 1000, if omega-3 fatty acid is to be given ahead of five grades. What is the dose of omega-3 fatty acids and what is the avail what is available in India? Now, the point is it is not available in India. Even in the US, it is available as a single brand, like I told you. And by recommendation, the omega-3 fatty acids, the European guideline has clearly come up and said, first you use omega-3 fatty acids and then go for it. Two grams twice a day is going to cost you 700 rupees in India. If you're going to be the US for $10, it's pretty expensive even there. And uh, you'll have to be using only four grams. The only other trial with omega-3 fatty acids, which is also the EPA, Purified form of EPA has been the Jellis trial from Japan, where they started using about 1.7 or 1.9 grams of uh, EPA. That was the basis on which the reduced trial was formed. In fact, I was talking to Deepak Bhatt when he had come to Chennai 
And this he told me this is the forerunner for on based on which they use four grams of EPA in these group of trials. And uh, given the fact that LPA is a major issue among Indians, should we consider testing it as an index A CBD even? Not routinely. The first primary target is to start looking at LDL cholesterol. And once you've achieved LDL cholesterol goals, what happens is the effect of LPA also comes down. And if you look at apolipoprotein B, the other part of the question that was asked, you're looking at the levels of LPA also. There's another concept of uh, apolipoprotein B being a better marker than LDL cholesterol because in a small dense LDL, the number of apolipoprotein B molecules are going to be higher. Because smaller molecules have lesser amount of cholesterol, but they're going to have more of ApoB particles. If you have a larger molecule of the LDL cholesterol, the ApoB particles are less and they're less heterogeneous. So there also it comes into picture. The LP little a is not a primary target. Another problem with LP little a is by finding out the value, what are you going to do? Maybe the PCSK9 works. The, uh, the, uh, the anacitrapib has been shown to reduce it by 30%. But what exactly is the clinical benefit? We're not so sure, so you may not be doing. When would you advise to check ApoB? I already answered that. The European guideline has come up with a very good answer for that. And there it seems to be working, working pretty well. So what's the next question? Can you explain about apolipoprotein types and significance of monitoring it? There are two types of apolipoprotein, the A and the B commonly. The B includes the B48 and the B100. The apolipoprotein B100 is the one that I've been talking about extensively. I think I should have already explained that question quite a lot. Practically speaking, there are clear benefits of checking apolipoprotein B because that seems to be further encouraging your uh, encouraging or reducing your risk factor profile and stratifying your risk, even when the LDL levels are very low, the ApoB levels are high, there is more of the small dense LDL particle, which I try to tell you, and they are going to be a little bit of a problem there. And uh, what about Nagabhushna? He's asked, what is the lowest level of LDL dangerous? What is the lowest LDL to be avoided? Now, I showed enough data to say that even LDL less than 10 milligram is safe. I have not seen one. The lowest value that I showed from my clinic was 21 milligrams. That patient has been having it for quite some time, more than a year. He's fine. No neurocognitive defects, no problem. He's doing absolutely fine. And he's continuing this high intensity stat without any problem. But I think safely, if you look at uh, it from a purist point, not a purist point, but from a moderate person's point of view, 25 milligrams seems to be reasonable because that is what the ODC trial did. 25, they said, was very reasonable. And there, I think, seems to be a very reasonable target of India cholesterol. Bring it down less than 50, it is pretty much safe. Abbas is my wants to know cost of PCSK9 therapy. Absolute indication, I think we have discussed more than frequency of administration. What is available in India is the envelope map. It is given twice monthly, and when you give it twice monthly, you give it as a uh, infusion, and when you give it subcutaneously, not as an infusion, give it subcutaneously, the cost of one dose of therapy is about 17,500 directly brought from the company. It's available in India. So per month, it will cost about 35,000. If you bargain and haggle, I think right now you can do it at about uh, 14,000 rupees. So a person should be able to shell out 14,000 rupees twice, twice a month. So it's going to be about roughly 28,000 rupees per month. It's pretty expensive and it's lifelong therapy because your cholesterols are not going to stay put once you've got it down once. It will bounce back. Narayanan Vinod Kumar, impressive talk. Who was that? Big query. Statins and pancreatitis, anecdotal myth, reality. Okay, the point with the... Uh, uh, statins is going to, and pancreatitis is more anecdotal, not there. Statins and renal failure, Yuvraj Bosle. Statins and renal failure, the only point the here go seems to be accepting is you can use atorvastatin, which seems to be better. And uh, up to 20 milligram, those who are on stage 4 or stage 5 CKD, don't start a statin, but if you're already on a statin, continue the statin. If you're already on dialysis and you're taking a statin, continue the statin. But they generally don't start a statin for those patients. But if you have an ASCVD, I will still be there to start a statin. At least 20 milligrams of statin. If nothing works, I start an on SD management renal failure. I think the nephrologists have their own whims and fancies. And because we see them once and thus subsequently they go back to dialysis and they change the dose, which is what happens practically in my case. People Patel wanted to ask APO A investigation should be done up to which age with high treatment for APO lipoprotein A, APO lipoprotein B. Apolipoprotein A is the beneficial one which is present in HDL cholesterol. HDL itself has become a little more complicated, so we really may not be talking much about it. Difference between VLDL and LDL. VLDL is nothing but one fifth of triglycerides. Now, the old concept of the good, bad, and the ugly, the good cholesterol being the HDL cholesterol is gone because the good doesn't seem to be good. It can be bad if it goes more than 90, so the HDL. 
not as much, but you think still want to make it good, probably do lifestyle modification, nothing more than that. The VLDL cholesterol is the triglycerides, that is in effect the bad, ugly cholesterol, the bad cholesterol we all know is the LDL cholesterol. The LDL clearly is the primary target of treatment, has to be brought down. The triglycerides have to be brought down, you have to bring it down to less than 150 to have ideally because if you look at the cholesterol, the first target is the LDL cholesterol, the next target is the non-HDL cholesterol which is the poor man's apolipoprotein B, which is what we call it. Because if you look at non-HDL cholesterol, it includes the triglycerides also and their treatment is also going to be statins. So push the statins, bring that down also. So VLDL is included as you first target, bring the LDL cholesterol down, next target, bring the non-HDL cholesterol. If you brought both down most of the time you're there, except if you want to be perfect like what we do, we try to look at apolipoprotein B and bring that down also in the target. That is also clearly mentioned in the European guidelines if you want to get it. Two brands, macros, triple max, a combination of EPA and EPA. There are absolutely no benefits of combinations. Only purified form of EPA has scientific basis. EPA of two grams twice a day, purified icosapentethyl is the only one that works. Now, if there is a question on indication of statin in non hemorrhagic stroke. I think now there have been some recent data, recent papers which are published and said up to less than 70, you have to bring down. And if you look at cardiovascular recommendations, we say that bring it down as low as possible. 70 definitely is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease includes systemic stroke also. So you can use statins, you must use non hemorrhagic stroke also in these group of patients. Murkabantian wants to know the difference between VLD and LDL, which I think I've answered. Can you explain PCSK9 inhibition in lowering lipids or cardiovascular systems? I hope this slides were recorded and you're going to get it to play later. Because I did a very clear explanation on how the PCSK9 works. PCSK9 gets inside the cell along with an LDL receptor and once it goes inside the cell, the PCSK9 destroys the receptor. If you inhibit the PCSK9, what happens? The receptor comes back to the surface and brings down further cholesterol molecules inside the cell for destruction. So the PCSK9 essentially Make sure that the LDL receptors on the liver don't get destroyed. That's what happens. Can you enlighten on vepidoic acid, which was recently approved for familial hypercholesterolemia? I didn't mention vepidoic acid. The mechanism of action is pretty much the same as the HMG CoA reductase or the statins. Only thing it acts higher at the uh, at the acyl CoA transferase uh, inhibition level, at the much higher level in this, and uh, it is pretty much the same. There are no outcome trials as on date. In combination with pentadoic acid and ezetimibe, it again seems to be working pretty effectively. So I think it should be possible to start using these drugs. And uh, I think what we should do is uh, we should start looking at more trials. There are going to be more trials. Can it be used as an alternative to statins? It is probably going to be used as an alternative to statins in future. And this is and we've taken. And how do you go about into statins and pancreatitis. There are a lot of myths about statins, the pancreatitis, the cancers, the bladder cancers, all those are myths. The major adverse effects I have already mentioned and we have covered it already. And Professor Santan Saha has one last question. What about, it suggests that ARB and statin may actually increase the risk of severe pneumonia in, uh, what is that? Is it in COVID, is he talking about? And uh, mortality in COVID-19. Okay, now my view on this. Now this is a Good question. There has been a very clear statement from all the major societies, the uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the European Society of Cardiology, the American Nephrology Journal Club, and uh, all the uh, British Hypertension Society. Everybody has said, please don't reduce the ACE inhibitors or ARBs. They are very safe. There is not enough evidence to stop statins in these group of patients. Uh, stop, I'm sorry, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs in these group of patients. But the ACE2 gene and the ACE2 gene helping it to get inside the cell. I have given a separate talk on that. I can give you a link for it later if you want, if you communicate to me personally. And uh, what happens is there is no basis for that. So please don't stop your ACE inhibitors. They are pretty much good and their benefits are much, much more. Please don't stop and get your patients into trouble at this point of time. Statins, not very sure, but I don't think there should be any problems. Another question which asked me whether from Uvaraj Bosa, which says statins before surgery should be continued. A little bit of doubt was there, but I don't think there is going to be any problem in starting statins. If you're going to have a combination with aspirin, I stop it temporarily and restart that because for a short time when you stop it, I don't think there's going to be much of a problem. That may not be much of a problem. Correlation with uh, lipoglin in diabetics and hypertriglyceridemia. Sounds very sensible. It is an anti-diabetic drug with uh, reduction of triglycerides. So I think it should make sense. But your primary treatment is going to be with statins, not with lipoglin, which is sarogitazole. 
So instead of going for sarvatitazone, first go for a statin. Statins have clear benefits. There's pleiotropic effects, reduction in mortality, all those benefits are shown only with statins. So first use the statin, statin, statin. If you don't have the beneficial effects, the triglycerides, let's say, are still going more than 500, you're still not able to get it on. Sugars are not controlled, then maybe there's going to be a benefit. Otherwise, I don't think there's going to be anything there for that. The vital trial for omega-3 fatty acid was negative. What is your take on this? Beautiful question. But have you read what is the vital trial on? Remember, I told you there are several other trials on omega-3 fatty acids that fail. This is one of the trials. Vital used the conventional combination of EPA and DHA. That's why it failed. Very simple. It answers the question that what kind of omega-3 fatty acid should be used. The only omega-3 fatty acids, I'm repeating it again and again, that works is 2 grams twice a day of purified icosapentyl pentatyl, or EPA. The other combination of omega-3 are all useless. And please don't use this. We ask Sharanya. Can I ask another question? When challenging with a statin for possible intolerance, which approach is better? Same statin with lower dose or another low dose statin? Now it's like asking me to say when the COVID is going to end. You know the answer better. But what I do, I will tell you. What I do is, I first try to use the lower dose, lowest possible dose of the same statin to see how it works. Because when you define statin intolerance, actually when you use two drugs, one drug should be at the lowest possible dose of one statin and a second statin at any dose. I told you two statins must be intolerant. This is absolute statin intolerance. There is another term called relative statin intolerance, wherein they can be intolerant to one statin and they can be tolerant to another statin. I didn't want to introduce you to all these complicated terms. Since you asked me, I'll come up with that. So you can use one statin first, and if it doesn't work, go for a next statin. If it doesn't, start the low dose of statin along with SD mine. That also is going to be pretty effective. Sanjeev Roy wants to know about uh, Saravitazar. We have spoken about this. Statins before surgery, we have discussed. Omega-3 fatty acids options in India. As of now, there's not much of options in India. We're not going to be having EPA. Even in the US, the company is not promoting it very aggressively. They're not pushing the uh, VASIPA that aggressively because they still have only the one gram capsule. They're not coming up with the two grams capsule and uh, they are not very keen on pushing it to two grams twice a day. So unless some company from India is going to do a study, some indigenous study with two grams twice a day, I think the out guys are pretty good at it. They keep uh, aping all these generics and uh, it's only a question of time which, before some Indian company comes up with two grams twice a day of EPA. Times are good for India, so I think we might have it. I think you have, you have closed all the questions. Friends, it's been a wonderful one hour sitting here, not doing much of academic activity. It's been wonderful talking to you. All of you, finally, before I end, I want to tell you, stay safe, stay at home as far as possible. Be with your loved ones. Enjoy the time. Spend your time with family, but also do academics. I've already written two papers. We are in the process of uh, writing up the third paper. So spend your time more usefully. Spend your time academically. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Wonderful being with you. I'd like to thank Torrent Pharmaceuticals also for giving us an opportunity to interact with so many people today. Thank you very much.